Okay. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Carmichael. I'm the director of the Pennsylvania State Archives, and I want to welcome you to yet another Community History Dialogue. You know, the word community is really important to these dialogues. A community is really a self-organizing association of people, and people form communities around all kinds of things, around religious affinities or sexual identities or race or gender or shared experience that could span a short period of time or it could span hundreds of years in many cases. And our goal is to help your community, however you define that, to identify and preserve its history so that ultimately you can tell your story in your voice because we think that is extremely important. And one of the best ways to preserve a community's histories these days is to do it virtually. And that's the glory of the age we live in. So I am especially delighted to introduce Dr. Barbara Zabrowski, who will talk today about her experiences with the Cambria Memory Project. They've done some amazing work uh, to scan materials from around the county that tell their history and to put it online where everyone can see it. And you know, one of the great things about these virtual collections is that you don't necessarily have to have somebody who preserves the original records. It would be good to preserve the original records but you don't have to have one facility preserving all the original records. Uh, you can join them together digitally and virtually rather than physically. Uh, Dr. Zabrowski has been a librarian for 31 years, during which time she has served in school, public, and academic libraries. Currently, she serves as Dean of Library Services and Special Projects at the Pennsylvania Highlands Community College. She received a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Writing and Secondary Education, a Master's degree in Library Science, and a Doctorate in Information Science from the University of Pittsburgh. In 2010, the Johnstown Area Heritage Association presented her with its Heritage Preservation Award for her efforts to digitize and preserve the history of Johnstown and for her original research on the Underground Railroad in Central Pennsylvania. She serves on the Governor's Advisory Council for Library Development and is on the board of the African American Heritage Society in Johnstown. But it is her work on the Cambria Memory Project that brings her to us today. And so I am delighted to present Barbara Zabrowski. Barbara. Okay, thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn off my video and share my screen. We're gonna go through the presentation and then we'll have time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. So let's start with the screen share. And let me turn off my video. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you today about preserving Pennsylvania history and culture and how I came to be um, involved in this. It actually really started, let's see if I can get this to work. It actually started with a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So in 2015, they launched what they called the Common Heritage Grant Program. And the purpose of this grant was to preserve local history. So we decided, the college decided to apply for a grant to capture the history of Cambria County. Now, why we did this was because one of the points we made in the grant was that history in Cambria County, we were losing it every day. And we were losing it in two ways. It was either being taken from the county when family members moved away, or it was being left behind with grandma, and when she passed away, it was being discarded. The intent was not for the college to keep and retain the physical items but to digitize and preserve an electronic copy. You'll see on this slide that there were only 38 grants awarded nationally, and we were fortunate enough in Pennsylvania to be awarded one along with the African American Museum in Philadelphia. So when we were putting the grant together, one of the things we talked about was I convened a group of our library staff, and I need to tell you that we are a very small community college. Uh, besides myself, I have one other full-time librarian, a full-time clerk, and a part-time clerk. So it's not as if, as if I have a staff of hundreds here. So we got together with our library staff and our IT staff, and we brainstormed ideas on what are all the possible formats 
that someone could bring an item to us to be digitized. So of course we figured, well, photographs, maybe letters or cards, any flat item we thought would be pretty easy to digitize. But then we thought, well, what about videotapes? You know, what about uh, home movies that are on videotape? What about genealogies or pictures that may have been saved on three and a half inch floppy disks? And I have to tell you, I work in a community college with a lot of young students and no one here knows what a three and a half inch floppy disk is. So it's always fun to show students what one looked like and how we used to preserve information. And then we talked about even 3D artifacts. What about a trophy, a medal, jewelry? What if somebody brings that in and wants that digitized as well? We also took a look at what equipment we already had in-house and basically it came down to we had a couple of scanners and we had some laptops. So then we had to decide what we were going to order. Now this next slide I'm gonna show you is a copy of the budget for our grant. And you're gonna see a lot of equipment at the top of the list. And we're gonna talk about that in more detail in a little bit. But you'll also see things in there like USB drives and preservation materials. Part of the Common Heritage Grant required that we do public scanning events. So we were gonna schedule events where you, know, you could gather up things from home, you could come into one of our events, we would digitize items for you. And we would give you a copy of that digitized content back on a USB drive. If a person brought a photograph in that we needed to put into some kind of um, preservation sleeve, we bought some of those as well. You'll also notice there are travel cases on there. It was our intent to make our scanning project totally mobile that if someone couldn't bring items to us that we could take our equipment and go on site and scan anywhere we needed to. Now the initial grant we got was for a little over $4,000 and you'll see here at the bottom we spent about $2,000 on equipment. The other $2,000 went toward programming. Part of the requirement for the grant was we needed to do public programming in the area to support the notion of local history. So we did uh, talks on Irish immigration. We did a lot of talks on coal mining, which was very big in Cambria County. So we had a lot of local scholars who came in and talked about coal mining, life in coal towns, uh, ethnic immigration into coal towns. So that took up the other $2,000 of the grant. So overall, it was a very small grant, but we did a lot of big things with it. One of the other things we had to develop as part of the grant, and this is really important, are release forms, or in this case, grant of permissions. Sometimes it's uh, grants of gift. This was important because when a person brought in something to be digitized, our intent was to make it public, to put it out on a web page, to put it in a repository. We also, so we needed their permission to do that. We also wanted to have some provenance on the item. We wanted people to be able to tell us where it came from, how did they get it, you know, what, what was the history behind it. So these forms become very, very important when you're collecting and digitizing information. Not necessarily at the moment of digitization, but later on when you're actually getting the materials ready to be included in a repository. And we will be talking about that later as well in the creation of metadata. I cannot stress how important copyright is in this case and who actually has the copyright. So when people came in, we had to ensure that they actually could give us this item to be digitized. And when we create metadata for items that we digitize, if they are not in the public domain, which would be before 1923, we make sure that we only use a right statement that enables the items to be used for educational purposes and not for for-profit ventures. So we had these public scanning events. How did they go? Well, let me tell you, they didn't go very well. We didn't have many people show up at them, even though we did them in different parts of the county. Um, these are examples of some of the things, you know, mainly it was, it was flat items, you know, a lot of photographs came in. We did get a couple of three dimensional items. You'll see there's a South Fork High School 1923 banner that would have been used at a football game. Now I wanna to talk to you about the spinning skull. No, nobody brought the skull in, okay? That's not a real skull. 
what we did was one of the things we bought as part We bought a tabletop photograph um, portable unit that allows you to take pictures of 3D objects, and it's got a turntable inside. So what you do is you set up a Canon camera, you put a three-dimensional object in there, you take a series of pictures as you rotate it a little bit, and then we put that in Photoshop to make this spinning image. So this skull actually just came from our biology department. It wasn't actually anything that came in for, uh, for a... Um, at a scanning event. So we were a little bit discouraged that, you know, we didn't get more public uh, support for that. But what happened was we decided to reach out to local libraries and ask them, hey, do you guys have anything that people have donated to you over time that you might want to have digitized? Well, if you know your local public library, they get a lot of donations of things from people in their communities. And we had three libraries in Cambria County, the Northern Cambria Public Library, the Hastings Public Library, and the Beaverdale Public Library, give us a great deal of materials to be digitized. And that really jump-started our collection. So if you're looking for items or places that may have local history that is of interest to you, please check with your local public library. I mean, they may have all kinds of things that they don't know what to do with either and you can maybe help them if you're a local historical society and you can work in partnership to get things digitized. So now I want to talk to you about where does all these things that we scan go. As a library, an academic library, I participate in a statewide program called Access Pennsylvania and Power Library. Most, if not all of the public libraries in Pennsylvania also participate in public library. One of the perks of participating in public library is you get to have collections in PA photos and documents. And PA photos and documents is the statewide repository for a lot of these, if not all of these digital items. So we get to have accounts for free. Now, what happens if you're a small historical society and you would be like, well, wow, I want to put things in PA photos and docs as well. There's two ways you can do it. You can partner with your local public library and you can have them upload thing, items that you've digitized into the, into the collection. Or for a fee of $325 a year, you can, your historical society can become a member of PA Photos and Docs. Now you might think, well, you know, $325, that's a lot of money for us. But think about this. It's a place where you get technical support there's great technical support um, from the uh, hosts of PA Photos and Docs, which is HSLC, Hosting Solutions and Library Consultants. You get great technical support. You have a place to put your digital records. They use Islandora open source software to run this site. And you get to share that with all the other agencies that are participating in PA Photos and Docs. So it kind of gives your collection a safe, secure, long-term storage space that preserves it kind of in perpetuity. They do all the backups. You never have to worry about backing it up or making or losing it. It's a, it's a nice way to do it if you can't do it internally yourself. So this is the page. This is the main page of our Cambria Memory Project page. Uh, memory projects, a lot of cities, states, counties across the United States do memory projects. So that's kind of how we decided to do, to frame our project. We make probably 80% of everything that we digitize available on PA Photos and Docs, but there are items that we do host locally here on the Cambria Memory Project that are housed on our college's servers. You'll see there on the page, we do have a Facebook page where we post periodically. We have links to local historical societies in the county. So we wanted to actually make the page not just about anything we digitized here at the college, but to create more of that community of other people contributing to us or in partnership with us so we get the broadest exposure for anything connected to the history of Cambria County. 
So I was presenting on the Cambrian Memory Project at a regional library conference. And at that regional library conference, a representative from HSLC, again, Hosting Solutions and Library Consultants, who manages PA photos and docs, was at the workshop and heard my presentation. And the person approached me afterward and said, wow, that's like great. You know, you got this grant and you're doing all this digitizing. And what impressed them most was the fact that, and we'll look at this in a minute, how cheap it was to do. After I bought all of the uh, hardware, it really didn't cost all that much. So we started to discuss, can we scale this up to make this a statewide initiative? And the answer was yes. So between the staff at HSLC and meeting with representatives from the Office of Commonwealth Libraries, which is the state library organization that oversees uh, public and academic libraries in Pennsylvania, we decided that we were, they, were, they would take some federal grant money and they would create scanning stations in the 29 district center libraries that are located across the state. And on this map, you will see there are 20, you will see the 28 district center libraries. Now a district center library, just for those who, who may not be familiar with this, it's a regional public library that provides outreach services to a specific geographic area. So for instance, I'm in Johnstown, you'll see the Cambria County Library in Johnstown is the district center and its district area is Cambria, Somerset and Indiana counties. So no matter where you are in Pennsylvania, you are not far from a district center library. And your local public library can put you in touch with representatives at the district center. So, and all of these centers have collections of the scanning, the digitizing equipment ready for loan. And if you are with a local historical society, Part of the caveat of having this equipment out there was local historical societies could borrow the equipment to digitize content as well, as long as they were putting, a, putting a, the final digitized items in PA photos and docs. So if you don't have the equipment, you can borrow it. So what was the equipment? Here's what it came down to. So I wanna spend a few minutes and talk to you about each of these pieces of equipment. So most of you probably have, you know, a PC somewhere in your library or institution, and if it's relatively new, it's got USB ports on it. So we wanted to make sure all of the hardware that we bought was easily plug and play. So let's talk about this. Let's start in the left side here with our Mustech scanner. Most scanners that you may have in stock or in your institution, they'll easily do eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. They may do legal size eight and a half by 14. The challenge becomes when you get a document that's bigger than eight and a half by 14, what do you do with it? You can scan it in pieces, you know, you can try and piece it together using software. But we found scanners that will do ledger size, which is 11 by 17. And surprisingly, that became very handy. It, it kind of encompassed almost everything that we got as far as like oversized diplomas, oversized certificates, bigger pictures, uh, longer documents. So we made sure that every kit included a flatbed scanner that would do 11 by 17 inch documents. The next scanner we provided to all the centers were the, was the Epson Perfection Scanner. This little thing is really amazing because not only does it do, does do flat things like pieces of paper, but if you see that little gizmo there laying next to it, one of the things it will do is will convert and digitize 35 millimeter slides and negatives. So for those of you who remember when you took a roll of film down to the local photo hut and you got the pictures developed, you got a little envelope back with the photographs in it, you either put those photographs in an album, you may have given them away to friends or relatives, but what you were left with was that little pouch that had all the negatives in it. So you could take those negatives back to Photo Hut if you wanted and get copies made. But pretty much over time, a lot of people were left with just those negatives. The only way to view those negatives, you know, you hold it up to the light, you look at it, you try and figure out who's in it. What this Epson scanner does is, if you put that negative in that little handler there on the left-hand side, 
it will scan those negatives and turn them back into photographs. So we have actually had people bring in both 35 millimeter and smaller negatives, and we have actually re-scanned and given them actual images back of negatives of things that they had long ago lost the pictures for. The same with the 35 millimeter slides. They were very popular in the 60s and 70s. Everybody took 35 millimeter slides on vacation. So a lot of people don't have 35 millimeter slide viewers any longer. So we converted a lot of 35 millimeter slides. Now, having said that, sometimes we get patrons who will come in. I had a gentleman come in one summer. He had a thousand 35 millimeter slides. They were family pictures, family vacations. He had no intent of having any of those loaded into PA photos and docs, but he wanted them digitized. So I basically told him, I says, well, you know what? Let me teach you how to do this. And you can just sit here all summer and do it yourself. And he did. He came in and used our equipment. He sat there and scanned all those thousand images. And he was, he was totally happy to do that. And he saved them all on a thumb drive. And now at least he can look at them again. So we bought as part of the kit an external CD, DVD, read, write. If you've noticed, a lot of computers and laptops don't come with built-in DVD drives anymore. So we wanted to make sure that we had an external one in case we, were, we ran into somebody who had equipment that didn't have a DVD drive built into it anymore. You'll see we have an external USB drive that reads a 35, a 3.5 inch floppy disk. Because there was a time when 35 millimeter cameras used three and a half inch floppy disks for photo storage. So some of you may have a lot of three and a half inch disks that have photos on them that you can't get off those disks any longer. So we made sure to include one of these in each of the kits that were given to the district centers. Now the next piece of equipment there in the middle of the screen is my absolute favorite piece of equipment. And this is the Elgato Video Capture. So this thing is about, oh, I'd say four inches long, the body of it. And what this is, you take a videotape player, you plug it into the RGB plugs there on the end. The other end has a USB end, you plug it into your computer. It has software that you download and install. And then you can record and convert any videotape, any VHS tape to digital. I don't know how many of you still have VHS players at home, but a lot of people got rid of them when DVDs came into play. But now they've got VHS tapes that they can't view any longer. We have done a lot with digitizing video content, graduations, weddings, vacations. I can tell you that we do not digitize anything that was commercially produced. So you can't bring your VHS copy of The Little Mermaid in here and expect us to make it digital for you. That we won't do. But homemade, home movies, anything else that you've recorded on VHS tape, we will convert. We actually had a gentleman here who worked in our IT department. He was a young kid, but he was enamored with the 1970s. So he gathered all kinds of stuff from the 70s. He even used an old IBM keyboard here at work that he really loved. But what he had was a beta player. And we had an employee here whose father had died many, many years ago. And the last videos of the kids with their father was on beta tape. And they hadn't been able to watch it in probably 30 years. So we got the kid from IT to bring his beta player. And this Elgato actually converted that beta tape into digital content. So we could give the employee the videos of her father with the family and everything on videotape that hadn't been watched in a very long time. So that was, that was really nice and encouraging. A terabyte hard drive we included in the kit just for digital storage. And then the last piece of information there on the bottom right hand side, this quarter inch jack to USB connector. Now, if you look this up online, they use this with guitars. Like if you have an acoustic guitar and you're going to record you plug in that quarter inch jack and then you can plug the USB into your computer. And by using a free piece of software like Audacity, you could record your sound. But what we use it for is old cassette players. If you remember the old cassette players, when you put a headphone on, it was a quarter inch jack that was the headphone jack. 
Why that's important is because a lot of oral histories were done on cassette tape. And you may have a bunch of oral histories on cassette tapes and you're saying, well, geez, how do I get them off of cassette tapes and into something digital? This quarter inch jack to USB connector is the way to do it. If you have the old cassette player, that's the, tr the trick. Now I do have to tell you that once we've started this process, I have become the collector of all things old technology. I must have five or six video players. Anytime somebody says, oh, I'm throwing away this VHS player, I'm like, no, 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 I'll take that off your hands. I have eight millimeter film projectors. I have about six or seven cassette players. I'm starting to hoard old equipment because oftentimes you need that equipment to play whatever storage it was saved on. For instance, I have several video cameras here that use VHS D film, like the, the fatter little condensed videotapes. And you have to have the original players to play a lot of this. So if you are holding old equipment, by all means, hang on to it. I mean, you can buy a new VHS player, but it's about $400 to buy. So if you have any people in your communities when they're getting ready to get rid of some of this old technology, if you have the capacity to store it, store some of it, at least to have a couple of backups, especially slide projectors, if you wanna do any uh, previewing of slides. Uh, like I said, uh, eight millimeter film projectors and VHS ones are the, the hot commodity. So for about $566, we provided all of those 29 district centers with this set of equipment. So this is what they have ready to loan to you if you want to borrow it to digitize items that you may have in your collection. Now I have to tell you, digitizing it, digitizing materials is the easy, fun part of the process. You can digitize like crazy, you know, scanning it, saving it, looking at it, talking about it. That's all great stuff. But then comes the hard part. And the hard part and the real work comes in creating the metadata that you need to create for every item in order to upload it to a repository. As I said earlier, the state system uses Islandora, which is an open source software. And on this screen, I've, I've given you just a little quick screenshot of the Island Door basic image content model, you know, where you open it and you start to put your information in. But what I want to draw your attention to is the, the block there on the right, the template. When you're digitizing items, you're using Dublin Core cataloging to digitize those items. And you'll see there a list of file names, title, subject, description, creator, publisher. This is the kind of information that you have to have to enter into a record in order to really give it uh, full credit when you upload it into a repository and to make it searchable. You'll notice there near the bottom, you will see a rights statement. This is where you're gonna put your copyright clause in there. And we use rightsstatements.org to uh, for our copyright statements. You're going to see things in there like date created and format and contributing institution. So there is a lot of metadata that you have to collect. And that's why, if you think back when I talked about those forms that you have people fill out when they bring items into digitize, the more information that you can collect at the onset, the better off you're gonna be when you get to this phase in your cataloging and you have to create this metadata. Now the picture I'm showing here on the left, I know you're not ever gonna be able to see all that tiny little writing under there, but that's what an image actually looks like in Islandora after you've uploaded an image and the metadata is directly beneath it. And we'll see that in a little bit when we go out actually live onto Power Libraries. So where does all this stuff go? As we've been saying, it goes to um, Power Libraries, PA Photos and Docs page. But that isn't just where it ends. PA Photos and Docs, is uh, partners with and is a partner in PA Digital. In 2015, PA Digital was created and it is a regional service hub for the Digital Public Library of America. So periodically over the course of a year, there will do a harvest from PA Photos and Docs. So PA Digital 
will harvest items, any new items that were input into PA photos and docs, and they will upload those into the Digital Public Library of America. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone out and, and looked around on the Digital Public Library of America. It's got millions and millions of records in it. But your items then become instantly available nationally. And that is really cool. Uh, being in Cambria County, one of the things we have is the Johnstown flood. So it's a, it was a national event when it happened. And all of our information, because we have it in Power Libraries, becomes searchable nationwide. Now, what I want to do is I want to just step off for a minute and show you, and we'll hope the technology works here for me. We're going to show you PA photos and docs. So let me start here on the main page. So when you go into Power Library, into PA photos and docs, and when you're on the website, you'll see there is the link right up here at the top where you collect, click to get into it. You will see all of the collections you can, they're listed by subject by default, but you can also change and sort by institution. You can search all the collections. But what I wanted to do is I'm gonna scan down here on this page and you will see there are scanned PA collections in here. And you will see the local public libraries that have participated and uploaded content into PA photos and docs. So a lot of these are district center libraries. Some of them are local small libraries. Some of them, as I said, have partnered with local historical societies to upload content. But this is, these are all part of the Scan PA project. Now I know I've had questions um, in the, we had some questions that at, when you registered, they asked about. So I wanted to talk about audio and video collections because they're like, well, what do I do with the oral histories? I searched, oh, let me get to this one first. I searched just the word audio in the search box on PA Photos and Docs, and it came up with 19,716 records. So you can upload audio content into PA Photos and Docs, and you can click any of these on, and you can listen to the audio recordings. Now, I tried this yesterday, and because of how we are doing this through Zoom, you wouldn't really hear anything. So I encourage you to go in and listen to some of the audio recordings. A lot of them are oral histories. But I also did a search for video, and you can upload video as well. So once you take that VHS tape and you run it through uh, Elgato and you convert it to digital, an MP4 file, you can upload it here. And I'm going to click on here, Lycoming College's graduation. And we'll let this open here and it will play. So you should be seeing it actually play. And this was probably taken with an eight millimeter projector in 1968. And it was converted to digital. And now you can watch it. So Format is not a problem once you get an item into a digital format. Island Dora and PA Photos and Docs is able to upload all of those formats. So you can do audio, you can do video. So I did want to point those out to you. And we can talk more about this when we get to the questions and discussion section of this in case anyone else has additional things I'd like to talk about. But what I wanted to kind of wrap up and end with a little bit here is why digitizing is so important. And I have some stories to tell you because I love to tell these stories just because I think they're really fascinating and I'm sure all of you have great stories and I can't wait to hear yours. So since we started Cambria Memory and it's been around since 2016, I told you we didn't have great success with our public scanning events. But over time, people have been finding us and they have been stopping into the library here at the college and they've been bringing me collections. And I want to talk to you a couple that we got that were really amazing. I got a call on the phone one day from a gentleman by the name of Chuck Felton. And Chuck Felton lives in Texas. But in the 1950s, he was a patient at the Crescent Sanatorium here in Cambria County. And the Crescent Sanatorium was a tuberculosis sanatorium. And there were only several of them across the United States. 
And the one here in Cambria County started in 1913. Well, in 2013, and, and the sanatorium, it closed in 1964 and became a state prison. So it wasn't like the, the sanatorium was still in operation in 2013, but a group of patients, and Chuck kind of um, spearheaded this, he wanted to celebrate the centennial of what they call the SAN. It was referred to as the SAN. So he reached out through social media across the United States, asking for anybody who had any connection to the Crescent Sanatorium. Were you an employee? Were you there? When were you there? Do you have any reminiscences? And he, cre he managed to gather and create a web page full of all this amazing content, photographs, letters, personal stories, diaries, medical information. Uh, anybody ever wants to do a report on tuberculosis treatment? This collection is outstanding. But Chuck's getting older. And in 2017, he didn't want to pay for the website anymore. And he didn't realize that once he stopped paying for that URL, all of that content was going to go away. So he reached out to a couple of historical societies in Cambria County if they would take on his project and they didn't have the staffing to do it. So he finally got in touch with me and I said, absolutely, Chuck, I definitely want to help you with this. I want to preserve all the stuff that you have gathered on the Crescent Sanatorium. So he gave us his, his the URL, he gave us his usernames and passwords to try and get all the information off. It took my other librarian about nine months of converting documentation to get it into our Cambria memory project and up onto PA photos and docs, but it is now an amazing collection of stuff on the Crescent Sanatorium. And at least three or four times a year, I get people who reach out to me about Crescent Sanatorium records because they either had ancestors or relatives or somebody in their family was at the sanatorium for tuberculosis in the 50s. So that was a really interesting uh, collection that we came to. The other one that I got recently is a woman in Punxsutawney. Her and her husband had owned, uh, at one point in time, the city of Johnstown decommissioned several fire stations. And they had bought a fire station, a brick fire station in the Cambria City neighborhood in Johnstown, and they lived there. Well, when the city abandoned the fire station, they found in the basement fire log books. And what fire log books are is, and I, I found out from talking to firefighters today, fire stations still maintain fire log books every day of activity at the fire station. They had 100 years worth of fire log books of every day's activities that occurred at that fire station in Johnstown. Every fire, every time they sent out for laundry, every time the firemen went out for meals, every minute of every day was recorded and we have we have 90 volumes of these fire log books that eventually we will digitize and put out there it's amazing the stuff that and you know as i always say if the antiques roadshow hasn't taught us anything it's amazing what people have in their homes and attics so why is it so important for the overall um, story of history well i would be remiss in cambria county if i didn't talk about the johnstown flood so let's take a look at the Great Flood of 1889. For those of you who may not be familiar with it, it occurred on May 31st in 1889. It was caused by the breaking of the South Fork Dam at um, the uh, South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, which was built by wealthy Pittsburghers as a retreat in the mountains to escape the heat and smoke of Pittsburgh. It resulted in the death of 2,209 people. Many people over time have written about the flood. Probably the most famous is David McCullough. He wrote a book on the Johnstown flood, which won the Pulitzer Prize. Recently, in the past several years, Al Roker wrote a book on the Johnstown flood. And in those books, a lot of the narrative and the story was based on people's diaries or writing about the flood. And they always talked about the force of the flood when it came through the valley, because it came through a very deep ravine. So the water, water had no place to disperse. So it caused incredible damage. But what else do we really know about the force of the flood other than what survivors had written about? Well, here's where digitizing history gets really interesting. 
So this past summer, a man by the name of Jim Bailey brought in a whole bunch of photographs that his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather had taken. And this was one of those pictures. Now, this is a picture of the Pennsylvania Railroad Roundhouse in East Connemaw Borough. East Connemaw Borough is just outside of Johnstown. It's on the Connemaw River. But they didn't know the date of this photograph. So I took it, I drove out to East Connemaw, I found the location on the opposite hillside where this photo must have been taken. I stood there, I looked at the buildings that are there today, I compared it to the buildings in this picture. I counted how many buildings were in this picture. I looked at old Sanborn maps, and we finally, was finally able to determine, based on some of the bigger structures in this picture, that this was taken in the mid to late 1880s. Now the flood is 1889. So this picture is actually before the Johnstown flood. I also had a gentleman by the name of Harry Dishon who used to work for Bethlehem Steel here in Johnstown. And he had a couple of maps that were interesting. One map shows the, the roundhouse in East Panama before the great flood. So here's a, here's a map of that roundhouse and I want you to take notice of all those little numbers of the engines that are in that roundhouse before the flood. And in particular, keep your eye here on engine 1169. So not only did they have, and they mapped out where all these trains were before the flood, they also mapped out where they were after the flood came through the valley. The roundhouse was destroyed. You'll see there that little circle, it says turntable pit. That was all that was left of the roundhouse in East Panama. And you'll see scattered there some of the engines. So here's a picture of the bigger map and you can see the roundhouse pit there on the right. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go down river here, almost to the end of the map here on the left-hand side. And you are going to see there, right at the edge of the picture, there's engine 1169. So that's how far down river 1169 was carried. But what makes this story even more interesting is that, courtesy of the National Park Service, they, in their collection, happen to have a picture of engine 1169. So this is why digitizing history is so incredibly important. We had three separate people on three different occasions bring in different items. All, not, these people weren't connected in any way at all. And through digitizing them, now we can actually document the force of the flood that came down through the valley in 1889. And that is what I think is so cool about digitizing this history. So we were able to piece this whole story together about what happened in East Connemaw. So that is why I think we need to digitize. And now what I'd like to do is throw this open. I think Tyler's gonna open this up to questions and comments at this time. So I will turn my, I will stop sharing. <laughs>